mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well yes it is well through it all through it all, my eyes are on me, and it is well, it is well. So let go of my soul and trust in Him. The waves and wind still know His name.
yes, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Come on, shout. Give a big, a big hand clap to our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Father, we worship you, we praise your name, we glorify your name. We praise and lift your name above every other name. You're the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're the everlasting Lord, the creator of heaven and the earth. Father, we worship you this morning. We exalt your name. There is no one else like you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're worthy. You're able. Come on. Worship the King of Kings this, in this moment. Tell him who he is and worship him and glorify him and honor him in this moment. God, you're holy, you're worthy, you're beautiful, you're wonderful. We exalt you in this moment. We worship your name because there is no one else like you. King of kings and Lord of lords, receive our worship this morning we exalt you because there is no one else like you you are highly exalted your lord your king you are master you are everything god we give you praise come on someone lift a shout in this place give God a big hand clap this morning and a shout to his name louder than that come on worship Jesus worship him his God is faithful his wonderful his wonderful God is good, yeah. He's awesome, he's beautiful, he's wonderful, he's indescribable, yeah. You can't find words to describe him in his fullness because he's in a class all by himself. Man is good, yeah. Please turn your Bibles to Joshua chapter one. Yeah, and um, this morning I'm speaking on the subject I've called covenant loyalty. God is loyal to his covenant. He's loyal to his word. He keeps his word. I'm going to read Joshua chapter 1. I'll read the first nine verses. The Bible says, and the heading says, Joshua installed as leader. I'm using the NIV. The Bible says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I'll give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river the Euphrates all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I sought their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous 
Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips and meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Come on, someone give glory to God for his word. Actually, we can just pick our Bibles and go back home because this is already beautiful enough. Hallelujah. I love the book of Joshua because it actually shows that God actually keeps his word. I love it also because it shows me that God is sovereign. In other words, how do you explain God giving the children of Israel a land that was not theirs? And he didn't actually even tell them, please go live with them. No, 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 no. Go kill everyone and take possession of that land. You cannot humanly explain that. That has to be his amazing love and him being sovereign. You can't fully understand why he's doing what he's doing, but he's God, you have to trust him. Amen. The book of Joshua is a new chapter for the children of Israel. It's, it's like a book end between Israel's past, Egypt and the wilderness, and the promised land. It is a book for those that have a promise from God. Anyone in this house has a promise from God, yeah? It is a book for those that have survived some things. If you know the story of these guys, they have survived the snakes, they have survived the wilderness, they have gone through just too much. It is a book for those that have encountered losses. You have to remember that most of their ancestors are actually buried in the desert. Because they left Israel, they left Egypt 600,000 men without counting women and children. And I don't know why they never used to count women, yeah? Imagine if they didn't, they didn't count us. That would be a loss, yeah? It is a book for warriors, not the weak. From the very start, these guys are fighting for what rightfully belongs to them. It had been 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. This group has also seen tremendous supernatural miracles and the mighty hand of God. They ate manna from heaven. They, need, they didn't have to cook anything. Every morning you wake up, there is food prepared in heaven, and you just wake up and go pick it up. They ate manna from heaven. They drank water from rocks. There was a pillar of the cloud during the day and a pillar of fire in the night. The Bible says their shoes never worn out. Joshua, the writer, has deeper experience than most of them. Why? Because he has been to Egypt, but at the same time, he has been to the promised land where they are going. Why? Because he was among the 12 spies. They are standing on the verge of a long-awaited promise. It carries a message for those who are stepping into, new, into a new season of their lives. Where they are right now, they can see what is rightfully theirs, but what does it take to actually take what is rightfully theirs? When you look here, you think their story begins here. God had given them a covenant about the land he's going to give them. But their story actually doesn't begin here. Their story begins with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. The Bible tells me in Genesis 12 verses 6 to 7, Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site, as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring, I'll give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And then God shows up again in the life of Abraham in Genesis 15. The Bible says from verses 18 to 21, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, 
to your offsprings, I'll give this land from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, to the land of the Canaanites, Canizoites, Cardamonites, all these tithes, yeah? And God also shows up in the life of his son, Isaac. This is what God says in Genesis 26, verses 1 to 2. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerah. The Bible says in verse 2, The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while. I'll be with you and I'll bless you. For to you, come on, and to your descendants, I'll give all these lands and I'll confirm my oath that I swore to who? To your father Abraham. God shows up during the time of Jacob and Jacob is Isaac's son. And the Bible says, and God said to him, I am the God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you. And kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also gave to you. I will give this land to your descendants after you. Come on. God is still consistent with the covenant he made with Abraham. And God shows up in the time of Moses in Exodus 3. And as he sends him to go rescue his people, he says, So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and I'll bring them out of that land into a good, spacious land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Come on. God was still keeping his word. And in Psalms 105 verses 8 to 11, the psalmist says, He remembers his covenant forever. The promise he made for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to, his, to Isaac, he confirmed it to Jacob as a decree. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. And he says to you, I will give the land of the Canaanites of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. Come on. This morning I came to tell someone that we serve a covenant keeping God. I don't know who has promised you something and not do it. I don't know who broke the engagement. I don't know who your uncle, your dad, your neighbor, your boss, who abandoned you and changed his mind. May I encourage someone this morning that our God in heaven is a covenant keeping God. Come on, shout praise to his name. The Bible tells me in Numbers 23, God is not human. Man is not human. God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. He's immutable. He cannot change. It is in, in his essence. That is who he is. If this thing is plastic, you cannot tell it to be glass. Why? Because, listen, I'm plastic. So God in his essence, in who he is, he can actually not change his mind. Someone be encouraged this morning and know that the God you're serving, the same God you've been worshipping this morning, he's a covenant keeping God. And how long does he keep his covenant? The psalmist has told us he remembers his covenant forever. For a thousand generations, you can give God a big hand clap for that. <laughs> that God, you are covenant keeping. God, I can worship you because I know you're not going to change your mind. There is not a time God is going to wake up. It's like, you know what? I don't, know. I, I, I don't feel like loving you. I don't think I'm going to be faithful to you. No, there is not a single time in your lifetime when God is going to give up on you because he cannot change his mind. He's not human. He's not human. Hallelujah. 
Anyone grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yeah. We are not faithful, but God is faithful. If you read the life of the Israelites, man, they were so, so annoying. Like, very, very annoying. They were rescued from Egypt. The moment they are in Exodus, by, by Exodus 33, <laughs> they told Aaron, you know what? We have an idea. Why don't we collect all the gold we have, yeah? And you make us some sort of, like, God. And Aaron didn't think twice. He, the Bible says he throws all the gold in the fire and makes a golden calf. Where is Moses? He's on the, on the mountain with God. And when the time when he comes back down the mountain, guess what? All the Israelites are dancing around the golden calf saying, this is the God who got us out of Egypt. If it were you, this would be the moment to give up on them. But because God had a covenant with Abraham, he's like, you know what? I cannot give up on these people because I made a covenant with them. Come on, someone give praise to our God. Yeah. Besides Joshua and Caleb, the rest are wilderness babies. Most of them, they've never been to Egypt. They had to tell them, by the way, in Egypt, we lived in a place called Goshen. <laughs> we used to eat like lettuce and watermelon. I don't know the accent they had then, yeah? So only Joshua and Caleb has been to Egypt. The rest are dead. What we have in Joshua chapter 1 is a new generation completely. We are living in a season of broken everything. <laughs> yeah. Of divorce and separation, broken promises, broken marriages, broken vows, broken hearts. <laughs> People don't keep their word. Disloyalty and dishonesty and betrayal. And sometimes we are trapped in that kind of thinking that maybe God also doesn't keep his word. But I came to tell someone this morning, God is different from all the people you know. He's a covenant keeping. God, come on, shout praise to his name. We are living in a generation where actually not keeping the word is actually kind of normal. But God keeps his word. I don't know about you, but our God has made some promises in scripture. I'll just read just a few. The Bible says in Isaiah 54, 10, Though the mountains be shaken and hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will never be shaken, nor will my covenant of peace be removed. That's the promise we have in the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms 125, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and when, and forever. Come on, give God glory this morning. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 28 verse 13, The Lord your God will make you the head and not the tail. Maybe you work somewhere and they're waiting for you to fail. They're waiting for you to fail. They don't know that there is a promise of God upon your life that you cannot be the tail. You can only be the head. Come on, give God praise. Woo! God is God. We are safe and secure in him. That a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your feet, at your right hand, but it will not come. It will not come to you, like it will not. Come on, even COVID came and was shocked. It is still shocked. We are still here. We are still here. Come on, because our God is so, so, so good. Give Him praise this morning. But going back to the text. This verse opens saying, after the death of Moses, I cannot bypass this statement. Because the question is, how come Moses is not making it to the promised land? How come this Old Testament icon, the greatest leader we see in the Old Testament, how come he never made it to the promised land? That it is Joshua who is supposed to take the people. Why not Moses? The reason is actually back in Numbers 20 verses 8 to 12. 
the Bible says, God told Moses, take the staff and you and your brother, Aaron, and gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. Very easy, clear instruction. The Bible says in verse 9, So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as the Lord has commanded. By, by, by here, he's still good, yeah? The Bible says in verse 10, He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, Moses said, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites. You will not bring this community into the land I'll give them. If that is not a lesson for all of us who are here and the leaders, I don't know what it will be. My next point is trust God wholeheartedly and honor him as holy. Our God is holy. He's nothing like us. He's supernatural. He's transcendent. He's in a class all by himself. Can you imagine Moses came and lectured the people? What did he call them? You rebels. The instruction was clear. Speak to the rock. But when you used to using your human strength, when you used, when you're kept, you are captive of having your human perspective in everything, you're going to go wrong with God. God told him, just speak to the rock. The glory was in speaking, not striking. God is glory was in him just speaking to the rock. That is what was going to make it a miracle. But because sometimes we are so in our mind, we are so myopic and we think we understand God. Because he was used to going, the Bible says, he used to talk to God face to face. Sometimes, that because he did this, because my staff divided the Red Sea, now I can actually do whatever I want. No. God is holy. God is righteous. He is God and he's in a class all by himself. There is no one else like him. The Bible tells me in Revelation, let me read it for us. The Bible says the first living creature was, let me read eight. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. And this is John writing and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. The Bible says, day and night, come on, there's a song in heaven, there's this chanting in heaven that never dies out. Day and what? Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And the Bible says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who live forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on, who, who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things and by your will they are created and have their being. That is our God. Give him praise this morning. That is God. We are not 
like him. For leaders who are here, sometimes you get in an office and you just talk to people the way you want. You call them whatever you want, like Moses called them what? Rebels. Man, God loves his people. And though he disobeyed him, God is gracious. He still gave them water. Can you imagine? It's like you're rebellious, but I love these guys. They are mine. And God still gave them water. I told Moses, you're not going there. You are not making it to the promised land. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy 34, if you read that chapter, God took him on the mountain and showed him. Like, you see that land? That's where I'm taking them. But guess what? You're not going. And the Bible says he buried him in Moab. Not in Canaan. In Moab. And the Bible says he was 120 years. And I love the right of Deuteronomy says his eyes were not weak, neither his strength gone. That is sad. You die with your full sight and your full strength. Why? Because you didn't treat God, you didn't treat him as holy and you never honored him. Sometimes I think we miss out on the promises and the things, great things God has for us because we've, we forget to treat him as holy. Amen to that. Man, Moses didn't make it. It, it breaks my heart. It really, really breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. Like, he, like, but also the good news, God buried him. I love that he honored him. God is also gracious and good. The Bible says up to today, they don't know where his grave is. For those of you who go to Israel, and I don't know, you cannot find the grave. But what we see, we see in the New Testament, during the story of transfiguration, where Jesus and Peter and James and John, they are there. Guess who shows up? Moses shows up and is glowing and glittering. You think he's dead? He's doing well because our God is redemptive and he's so good. Come on, give him praise. Yeah. He's so good. I went to do a driver's license when I was in the U.S. A driver's license exam. So there was this question. It stayed with me. The question was saying, is attaining a driver's license in the United States a privilege or a right? I'm like, man, I have a visa here. <laughs> it's my right to drive here because I have a visa. So you click right. No, you're, it's wrong. It's wrong. The answer is wrong. Because to the Americans driving in their country is what? A privilege. All of us who are here and you have an opportunity to serve God, it is a privilege, my friend. It is a privilege. He has a thousand million trillion people he can use in your place. So treat him as what? As holy. Treat him as holy. Treat him as holy. He has procedures how he does things. Paul said, no, uh, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I think, I think Paul got it. You can preach and preach and preach. And God is like, eh, <laughs> uh -uh. yeah. Point number three. Let's talk about Joshua from verses 2 to 6. God tells Joshua, he told Joshua in verse 2, Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'll give to them. I'll give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised to who? To Moses. And he tells Joshua, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Can you imagine God saying that to you? 
that no one else, no one will be able, like, oh, not for 30 years, no. All the days of your life. Some people think that Joshua became a leader here in chapter 1. But no. In Numbers 27, from verses 15 to 20, after Moses had known that he's not actually going to lead these people to the promised land, he said a prayer, he said, Moses said to the Lord, may the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them, into, who will lead them out and bring them in so that the Lord is people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Moses didn't know what God's response was going to be. See what God tells Moses. He said, so the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, and make a man in whom is the spirit of leadership. And lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eliezer the priest and the entire assembly and, the commi and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. So here, what we see in chapter 1, they are calling him Moses' aide, like a servant or assistant. What this guy did for most of his life, he was just assisting Moses. That's all he did assisting this great leader. Some of you who are here, your job is actually an assistant. You're not the chief CEO. But God has placed you there for a reason. But sometimes we put ourselves in positions too soon and God is even shocked you're taking over that job. You pull off one sermon and you're like, God has called me to plant a church around Kigali Heights. God is like, what? No. Maybe you still need some years to serve. Just, just serve. Just be someone's assistant. Do we have assistants here? <laughs> You're not the president. Come on, be, be that. If you're not the president, be that that is not the president. I don't want to describe it, yeah? <laughs> if God has called you to be an assistant, go the, be the best assistant in the whole world. If God has called you to clean this place, clean it and leave it sparkling. Who knows when his blessing will come? Who knows when the move of God will come? Who knows what time of the day or night of the year when God will be like, okay, you've done so well here. Okay, move here. Joshua was just an assistant. And then to when God showed up with a death announcement, my servant Moses is what? He's dead. Now you. Now you. Sometimes before God brings the announcement, oh, you're, you're, you're not even there. You're already gone. You're already gone. I love that God tells Joshua, listen, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Go read the book of Joshua. This guy fought off bad guys. Like there is victory all over the book of Joshua. Dividing the land to this stripe, to this stripe, to this stripe, to this stripe. Jericho is airtight. It's down on the ground. Come on, the city of Ai. God told Joshua, just point your javelin up to there, to that city, and it will just fall into ruins. Our God is God. He told him, he gave him assurance that no one will be able to stand against you. All of us who are here, we are children of God. You think we are on our own. No, we are not. We have this promise of God and the hand of God upon our lives. It's as if you try to make us sink, but somehow we cannot sink. Because we have the hand of God upon our lives. Come on, give God praise this morning. And my last point that I have to use the last two minutes. God's promises come with conditions. Yeah. 
You know, like, have you ever downloaded a software and has terms and conditions and agreement? You just have to click. If you don't click, man, you cannot go to the next step. Steve Jobs? Yeah. So God told Joshua, yes, you can lead these people, but there are some things, some virtues in your character you need. You need to be strong and courageous. Have you ever, been, have you ever seen people who are weak, but they are courageous? Yeah. Like you have, you have zero energy, you have zero strength. You're, you're, you're like, you're so weak, but you're so courageous. So God told Joshua, you need to be strong and courageous, maybe strength of heart. And also tells him, obey all the law, like all the law that Moses gave you. And he tells him, keep this book. Keep this book of the law always. Not sometimes. But when? Always. On your lips. And he tells him, meditate on the word. Day and what? And night. And he says, do everything written in it. God is promises and the things he wants to do. Sometimes they come with conditions. Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city. And God tells Joshua, do not be discouraged. Because actually the guys, he was talking to Joshua, but he also knew that Joshua has been to the promised land. And the 10 other spies died in the wilderness because they didn't believe. So Joshua has seen all these giants in the land. And God had to remind him, come on. You have seen those men, but I have to tell you something. Be strong and be courageous. Do not be discouraged and don't be afraid. Because sometimes fear engulfs us so soon. But his word anchors us. His word keeps us strong when you don't know what to do. You run to this book. On my wedding, my mom showed up with a brand new Bible written on Echitabo Echitukuvu. It was her gift for me on my wedding. It was not wrapped, no. She just walked down the aisle and gave me the book and said, everything you need is in this book. Come on, everything we need is in this book. Clap like you mean it. Because everything we need is actually in this book. David said, your word is a lamp to my feet. It is a light on my path. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Can you imagine? Isaiah 40, the grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Come on, give praise to our God. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away. Can you imagine? Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never, never pass away. Isaiah 55, 10 to 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and make it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that cow goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve for the purpose for which I sent it. Come on, give praise this morning to our God. Give him praise because his word remains. It endures. Stand up on your feet as I tell you something else. There are zillion, trillion promises we have in our God. If you want to see how these guys, how the story ends, go and read after chapter, verses 9. 
all the promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Did you know actually the name Jesus in Hebrew is the same name Joshua. Their names are identical. Whatever Israel received in the promised land, they received through the hand of Joshua. Whatever we receive from God, we receive through Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's our Joshua. Come and give him praise this morning. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.19, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, and by me, and by Silas, and by Timothy, was not yes and no. But in him it has always been yes. And verse 20 says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Come on, hallelujah. Give God praise this morning as we worship him. Let's give him a big, a big hand clap. Come on, clap those hands to Jesus. Worship him. He's good. His promises are yes. And amen. Let every man be a liar. If you're here and you are abandoned, you are rejected, your husband walked away, you don't know whether when he goes, he will return. If you're here, you don't even know when your dad left. If you're here and I don't know what's bothering you. I don't know who promised you what and they never actually did it. May you find comfort in him. With these days, with a divorce, with everything, with, with broken everything. Come on, find comfort in this God. Find hope in him. Trust him completely. Treat him as holy. Treat his people well. Be an ambassador. Let us reflect Christ. Let someone look at you and see Christ. Come on, let's worship him this morning.